Markets are pretty stuck right now, hardly moving last week after some major catalysts like CPI, PPI, retail sales, and even the beginnings of bank earnings kicking off the earnings season, right? So financials will continue to report this week alongside some big names like Netflix and Tesla. The key question becomes, is it enough to take us more meaningfully out of this balance in the upward direction? Or will this just turn into a fake break? And should we expect a retest of SPY 401? Those will be the questions that we explore in today's episode of the weekly watch list. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And stay tuned until the very end of today's show. I've got two additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly time frame, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure this past week, we're certainly dealing with a solid green bodied bar with a little bit of a pesky upper wick on top, but it's certainly not as meaningful as an upper wick that would look something like this. We know that we've closed in the upper third of the weekly range. There's some sellers hanging out up towards the highs, but there's not really an attempt from the sellers early on in the week to move us underneath the previous week's low. So let's save location for just a second, but overall structure does strike me as more bullish than bearish. If we think about the bar to bar account, yes, we have technically produced, as we were just alluding to, a small, very nuanced higher low, as well as a higher high, also stacking up in the bull side of the analysis here. We could also say that we've spent yet again another week above the top of the banking crisis candle high, which also stacks up as a bullish data point. Because of that, I would say that, you know, the more time we spend above the top of that breakdown bar, the less likely it is that this actually turns into a head and shoulders pattern. Ideally, that right shoulder would have been underneath the top of that breakdown bar. Now, you might say to me, Matt, well, what about the double top that's brewing here? I would say, sure, we may get a pullback off of the equal high, but if this is going to turn into a full-blown reversal off of a double top, just remember that that requires breaking down underneath the neckline to actually produce a new lower low, which brings me to the next pattern kind of in play here. If we zoom out a little bit on the weekly time frame chart, you could certainly start to make the argument that this is turning into an ascending triangle right? And a break here takes us out of the weekly balance that we've really been concerned with over the past, you know, month and a half's worth of trade as we've approached the top end of this balance range. If we go ahead and throw on the Fibonacci's from the high all the way down to the low of this drawdown, I want to start bringing this into the weekly analysis here. What you'll notice is that we're right at the 50% retracement. So the bearish narrative that says like, hey, new lows are incoming. We've built a pretty sturdy base underneath us here as this weekly balance has been unfolding. I'm not convinced that the buyers who structurally have put in a very constructive look here with weekly higher lows are ready to just give it up so easily and look for new lower lows. So I'm not convinced just from a technical point of view that the bear case is ready to produce new lows on the weekly time frame chart. Now, again, we could see a reasonable pullback here. I'm not saying that the market can't move lower. I'm just not seeing the argument right now for a larger deterioration on the weekly time frame chart. We could even come in with something like the anchored view apps from the all time high and the October bottom. And last week, we pushed away from that upper band in the upward direction. That has to strike me as once again, a more bullish than bearish data point. If we go ahead and throw on the volume profile from the weekly perspective, we've pushed away from this high volume node, obviously in the upward direction. We've rotated through the low volume void and we're sitting right on this area of high volume. So once again, with the equal high being produced on the weekly time frame chart, is it reasonable that the market pulls back this week? Absolutely. And does that destroy the trend? The answer is no, right? If we zoom in, on this uh, weekly time frame chart, if we're isolating price action to this box right here, we know we have lows, higher lows, nuanced higher lows. Along the way, we've got highs, higher highs. I would start to think of this as equal highs. If we pull back, there's an opportunity for the higher low and the weekly trend will not change. In isolation here, it is you know starting to become a firm uptrend. Of course, we know that things become much more constructive on the bull side when and if we can break this balance range in the upward direction. Expected move is always up first on the daily time frame chart. If you're not familiar with this study, top right hand corner's got you covered with a brief tutorial. If we're contained by the upper edge of the expected move, the number is 41840. That of course implies a higher high over last week's high and an equal high to the pivot from February. So that of course does strike me as bullish higher high in an uptrend 
bullish. If we're contained by the lower edge of the weekly expected move, the number is 40661, and that's roughly the equivalent of the equal low from the daily balance area in here in an uptrend equal low. Again, that does strike me as being slightly bullish. But do I think that we are to be contained by the expected move in the coming week's worth of trade? Absolutely not. And the reason I think we're going to breach the expected move this week is because markets typically move from balance to some form of excess. So be it up or be it down, I do think we will violate the expected move. So don't be surprised if that does happen because the market is trying to expand from this range. Now, our job, of course, is to identify in which direction. So let's talk about the upside first because on the hourly, I think we'll see a small piece of evidence that may suggest we could hold here above 411.75. That's the key level for the rainbows and butterflies situation for the buyers staying above the top end of the balance area here. We should look for rotations in the upward direction for 16.75 equal high on the weekly time frame chart. And after that, again, if we are expecting a breach of expected move, the next overhead target is a gap close from 420 up to 421.23. If we do not see continuation over 411.75, it's still okay if buyers can find a daily higher low above 409. It has to be above 409. Otherwise, that's where we start to get concerned about downside outcomes. Why 409? Because that's where the Thursday rally stemmed from that took us out of the balance range in the first place. If we fall underneath 409, I think the expectation should be for a test of 406.15, which we know is a weak level because we have all of these precise touches as well as a market profile poor low reference point there. And when and if that breaks, I think we should expect a prompt rotation to test 401, which we've built the case for in the past, right? So that's the up and downside scenarios for the coming week's worth of trade. We'll get to the hourly chart in just a second, but if we do see a two sigma move, in the downward direction. So if we get twice the expected move here, two sigma, notice a doubling of that range from the close, right? Because that's how we're calculating this. It keeps us at 401. So could the weekly time frame chart find a higher low here, even if we do see an aggressive breakdown? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. So that's what we've got in the daily time frame. Let's take a look at the hourly chart for a bit more supporting evidence of why I think buyers did make a solid effort into the close of the week. So you'll notice Thursday, obviously, we get the strong break in the upward direction. There's not even a hesitation at the top of the range intraday there at 411.75. That does strike me as a sign of strength on Thursday session. But Friday, it's like, what's up with that weakness on the Friday morning session? There's an attempt to continue higher, keep the breakout going, completely falls underneath 411.75. So it's the opposite, right? The buyers do not even make an attempt to hold up for support here intraday. But here's where it gets interesting. Into the rally close of Friday's session, notice that the sellers do make an attempt to drive prices down off of 411.75, trying to produce a lower high in the balance range. That's what the lower wick of the last, second to last, I should say, hourly bar represents. Where do the buyers close? On the daily chart, we see this, but it's back above 411.75. So there was a pretty decent effort from the buyers into the close there, which once again, leads me to believe that if we see you know, an open on Monday's session above 411.75, I think the idea is to look for something that does this. Anything that holds up above that number, look for upside, right? We are trying to get a break of the daily balance range, this area here, and you know, overhead targets 416.75. We talked about downside. If we come back into the range, buyers can try to find an hourly higher low here above 409, but if that fails, again, this is certainly a flush point. And if we violate that, there's not a whole lot of support until we get back down towards 401. Market internals are our first bit of supporting evidence. If you're not familiar with the screen, top right-hand corner's got you covered with a brief tutorial. Overall, we are seeing inflows on the week, but they are not significant. They did not breach 500 million in the upward direction. For the most part, we did spend a majority of the week in the positive territory for our advanced decline line, and the cumulative builds on the tick are very mild in the upward direction. And I think that this can clearly outweigh one single day of downside reads here on Friday. The concern with the market internals this week is really the discrepancy between the Tuesday session and the Thursday session. We know that on Thursday, Thursday is the day that the market breaks out of the balance area. Why were the internals stronger on the Tuesday session and weaker on the actual breakout day. Notice that the volume reads on that individual day did not get up and over 300 million. Notice that on Tuesday, the advanced decline line actually makes it into trend higher zone, whereas on Thursday, it comes up short. In terms of the cumulative build, a little bit stronger on the Tuesday session, Thursday, a bit weaker here, especially with that fading move into the close. So I'm not all that confident in the upside break yet. That's why, again, it's kind of like acceptance above 411 is kind of 411.75 is kind of required 
on that SPY daily chart. Otherwise, you know, I think a pullback could be in store. Obviously, Friday speaks for itself. It's a concern with a negative cumulative build, outflows from the market on that individual day, and just an, uh, you know, a hideous trend here in the advanced decline line. It's not enough to fully say that, like, okay, everything is just wiped away. Um, you know, bears are in control. But for the most part, like a little bit skeptical of the breakout on Thursday, hopefully, as you can see from this walkthrough. Market profile is always exhibit B, video tutorial in the top right hand corner. If you're not familiar with this screen, what we need to dissect is the Thursday and Friday session specifically. Notice that on the Thursday session, as the breakout is taking place, value area does shift higher in the overall individual range and the point of control shifts higher with price as well. That does strike me as a sign of confidence from the buyers, although we did just see that conflicting market internal screen. So take that with a, maybe a grain of salt, especially when we follow it up on Friday with value inside of the Thursday session back inside of most importantly, the daily balance area, right? Point of control in the daily balance area as well. So yeah, the close was higher here above the top of the daily balance. But if we scrunch this up to reveal the entirety of this area that we're talking about, this is the balance area here basically, right? Notice that the point of control is above as of the Thursday close. We close above on the Friday session, but where's the point of control? Again, it's inside of the balance area on the daily time frame chart. So a small bit of you know concern about upside continuation is certainly reasonable at this point in time based on some of these indications. We also know that we have poor lows stacked back here at the bottom end of balance. So I wanna remind you of that in case we do see a violation of SPY 409, this should be the target and a breakdown there should lead to SPY 401. Let's go ahead and take a brief look at a zoom in of the Friday low because we also have a poor low here. Technically, this lacks meaningful excess. It's only one tick. We typically look for two or more to say that the low is decent or just not a poor low. If we sweep that low, what I want to point out about this is taking out this low and then quickly coming back above represents support at 409 on our SPY itself. That's basically the midpoint of the balance range. So repairing the poor low from Friday and then finding acceptance back inside of Friday's range, that would strike me as a bullish indication if there is a sell-off that starts to pull back in the first place. That's kind of what you're looking for if you're a bull and the market does not hold up above SPY 4.1175. Moving back on over to Thinkorswim to evaluate the weekly performance of our sectors reveals that XLF Financials actually led the pack here primarily with the gap and go from the Friday earnings session up 3.17% on the week, followed by industrials and XLY consumer discretionary. So there is a decent rotation into some risk on assets as we saw this break of the top of the daily balance area. At the bottom of the barrel, we see real estate with the big update in rates on Friday, as well as utilities and consumer state Staples are the laggard, but still green on the week. Nonetheless, the rotation that we've been talking about from the risk off sectors performing as we were stuck in a sideways balance to then rotating into risk on assets as and if a breakout does start, so far that does strike me as bullish posture. But let's take a look at the structural charts and evaluate what's going on from a trend perspective. So here's that gap and hold on the Friday session in financials. As long as we stay above at this point in time and find any higher lows above 3225. I think that this could reasonably produce a pullback, do something like this, and then start to retrace some of this thin structure from back in here. That, of course, does represent the banking crisis. Now, not all of the bank earnings are out, but the primary constituent, JP Morgan, of course, did report on the Friday session, and all things kind of went dandy there. So that's kind of what's leading to this preliminary gap up. Let's see if we can get continuation or a mild pullback that holds for a structural higher low. Again, the level to watch is 3225. As long as we're above that, I think financials are acting as a bullish force for our markets, trying to get back through some of this thin structure. Recall also that this is a fairly heavyweight sector in the S&P. XLI industrials are up next. Notice that they're just stuck in the midpoint of this range here. I don't really think that there's much to say about whether or not this has directional pull, pull for the S&P, unless we're either over 103 or back underneath 96.75. Now, if we think about this in isolation, of course, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, this double bottom at first, the neckline absolutely did not hold on that blast right through it, but we did find ourselves a higher low technically on the daily time frame chart, and this is a higher low as well. Now, this neckline is acting as support as of the Thursday session, so the look would be bullish if we can break $100.15 in 
the upward direction, but is it going to make or break the S&P? Probably not all by itself. Next up, we've got the XLY, and although it was towards the top of the list in last week's lineup over here, it's not doing anything impressive on the daily time frame chart. We've talked about this in the past. This balance area needs to resolve in the upward direction. The XLK tech sector has really pulled the S&P 500 higher as it's remained in this bull flag consolidation on the daily time frame chart. The XLY has not pulled any of its weight. It's just stuck back in this balance. Again, it is constructive that we have a higher low here above 141.75, the midpoint of the range, but it's got to get in gear over 148 if something more impressive is going to take place for continuing on the SPY daily timeframe. With Tesla reporting this week, that should be a big catalyst to watch out for here in the XLY. So just continuing to monitor 148 if we're above bullish force for the S&P. If we're just stuck inside sideways here, I would say it comes down to some other key sectors that we'll get to in just a moment. And then of course, a violation of 141.75 red flag run for the hills in the S&P if the XLY starts breaking down underneath 141.75. Next up, energy sector, lightweight sector, risk off sector. It is putting in an ascending triangle here, a break over 87.50 to lead the market. If the XLY does not get over 148, for example, would be a big cause for concern. You don't want defensive sectors leading any rallies in the market. Next up is materials, lightweight sector, three-day balance going on here. Slight bullish pressure if it's up, slight bearish pressure if it's down. This is not a make or break for the S&P. XLC communications start to becoming slightly concerned with this one with the very incremental higher highs. It just means that longs are not really being rewarded for their risk taking as a long essentially in the XLC, right? It's been very incremental chugging in the upward direction. There's no reason to panic yet, but it does increase the odds of a liquidation break, aka longs with terrible location up here towards the top of the move. They all close out at once and it produces a deeper pullback. Now, structurally speaking, as long as we're above 56.75, not really a cause for concern, right? You have a move, sort of pullback, move, deeper pullback, not the end of the world as long as we find a higher low above 56.75. If the pullback does happen, if there is a liquidation break, of course, intra-week, it is bearish pressure for the S&P, so something to be mindful of there in communications. XLV healthcare sector, second heaviest weight by market cap. It's just continuing to truck along in the upward direction. This is sort of indicative of that recessionary theme, but notice, percentage-wise, it didn't really outperform, and that's really because of the Friday pullback uh, and sort of close week on the lows here. So I would be mindful of of 133.75. A breakdown there should produce some bearish pressure for the S&P. It's all going to boil down to this guy right here, the XLK. Is the XLK going to save the week and continue to make the S&P move in the upward direction? If so, it's got to resolve this balance area here in the upward direction. It's got to break balance over 149.15, at least tag the equal high at 151.50, and then see continuation after that. If we are looking for a range double, notice that that does take us perfectly to the equal high here, but ideally, we do see some push beyond that. I'm not calling for the first start of the gap up here at 155.80, but you know, upward pressure certainly if we can take out this pivot high. The reason that this needs to break out is because again, we're seeing some of these heavyweight sectors like the XLV, potentially the XLC from a risk on perspective, XLY lagging. XLF looks okay, but there could be a pullback, right? If the XLK can't break out of balance here, that's not really a good look for the S&P on its own. Breaking down underneath the bottom of balance, a deeper pullback should unfold into 144. Of course, that's bearish for the S&P. If we want to see the XLK break out of balance in the upward direction, then we want to see the XLP break out of balance, but in the downward direction, right? If we're going to see a risk on move in the market, it should not be led by the consumer staples. So this wants to break 75 in the downward direction to rotate through the thin structure and potentially catch itself for a higher low off of 74. That would be constructive from a posturing perspective in the S&P. If this breaks the balance in the upward direction and the opposite happens in the XLK, again, there's your red flag run for for the hills. Let's get into some of these really lightweight sectors. Real estate, of course, much more to do with the wealth effect with rates rising on Friday. No surprise that this is lower. I would say it does start to become more of a drag for the S&P as it starts breaking down underneath 36. And last but not least, we've got the XLU for utilities. It certainly did, uh, or it was attempting rather, I should say, to put in a balance area here. Strong support on the Thursday session, trying to bring it back into that range. But notice that Friday is consolidation underneath 69.25. I would be looking for downside outcomes here, which actually is good from a posturing perspective. You want to see this remain underneath 69.25, pull back, catch a higher low off the neckline of this double bottom pattern from in the past at 67.75, and then rotate in the upward direction. So, so far, so far, the sector rotation does look good, but it's going to boil down to follow through from the XLK, follow through from the XLY and XLF if this risk on look is going to be preserved in the S&P.
Here is the ratio grid. If you're not familiar with this screen, top right hand corner's got you covered with yet again another tutorial. The top four are the heavyweight sectors for the S&P. If the XLK can catch itself for a higher low above the upward sloping 50 SMA, it probably coincides with a structural balance break that we just saw on the candlestick chart that would be constructive for preserving the risk on look. The XLV is slowing down here, which as we know is indicative of the recession theme when and if this is taking off in the upward direction. So the fact that it's slowing does strike me as a bullish indication. It'd be really helpful if the XLF could start to retrace some of this thin structure from the breakdown and banking crisis. We'll see if that can be the case with bank earnings continuing this week. And the XLY, it was starting to, to deteriorate rapidly in here. The fact that it's catching a bit of a minor footing into the end of the week does strike me as being somewhat helpful, but it's not certainly, uh, certainly not contributing to the risk on look in the marketplace right now. The closest tie to the XLK is really the strength in the X. LC, continuing to just chug right along in the upward direction that does strike me as constructive and more risk on as opposed to risk off. If we look at the bottom four sectors, these are the lightweight sectors for the market. XLP, in deterioration, XLU, in deterioration. XLE is the only one that's kind of hanging in there sideways at the 50 SMA. We know that real estate has to do with the wealth effect. So we're not seeing a full-blown risk off look, but it would be certainly helpful for the risk on look if XLF could really perk up and the XLK could find a higher low here above the the 50 SMA. Let's take a look at the XLY versus the XLP. So we have growth, of course, versus value, trying to find some support very similar to the XLY relative strength chart that we were just looking at above the gray bar, which represents the double bottom from here. And of course, the nail in the coffin for the final leg lower. So as long as we're above uh, 1.9, it's not the end of the world. But again, this slow malaise in the downward direction is not all that confidence inducing for a big break in the upward direction. It would be ideal if this could come in for the equal highs much closer to 2.1 and then see continuation in the upward direction. Checking in on the dollar, we are still underneath the bottom of this balance area in here. The number is 102. If anyone knows what's going on with Thinkorswim's data, let me know. These should not be dojis. If we go on down to something like a 30 minute time frame chart, what I want to point out is that uh, again, the close was fairly strong on the Friday session up towards the top of the range here, but the, uh, the daily bar certainly looks kind of funky there as a hammer candle. Nonetheless, we are underneath the balance and you just want to watch for rejections of 102, a lower dollar here should correlate to higher equity prices. And you could see the same thing if you go to a proxy like the UUP, for example. If you just take a look at this as the balance range, this is that green close on Friday. We want to remain underneath that level. If we take a look at the gold contract, I want everybody to be very aware of what's going on here. The first test is always the best test. So break, retest, and rally. You don't want to trust the retest this time around at 2000. It may hold this support, but I would not be a buyer here until we first firmly start to resolve that in the upward direction. Now, why is that? Here's a little bit of a, a tactical trading lesson, right? If you get buyers sucked in at the higher high breakout, and now we close underneath this pattern right here, what should happen on a lower low, right? Those buyers are invalidated. They close out, adding more selling pressure. It's a fake break. So just be very mindful of 2000 in the gold contract this week. And the same thing could be said about something like silver here, the SI contract coming in for a retest of that breakout point at 2522. But just remember, it was a gap up here in the regular trading hours session that provided the move higher in the first place, really more evident on something like the SLV uh, ETF. Notice on the Wednesday break, breakout, right? This is a hammer indicating the gap higher retest. So we've already retested the breakout point at 23 and pushed away into the Thursday session. Again, the first test is the best test. I would not trust 23 in the silver contract once again on the second go around. So in theory, if these levels start to break down, what does it mean for the dollar is the question to be asking. Higher dollar should mean lower equity. So just be very mindful. Gold 2000, silver right around 23 in the ETF, and it was 2225, I believe, in the SI contract. Let me just double check that for a 2522. Uh, excuse me there. Let's take a look at interest rates now. We know that they were higher on the Friday session. Of course, I want to point out that we're back inside of this range here. But if we zoom in and isolate to this range, I think that this is kind of noteworthy, right? Look below and fail, made it to the top. Look below and fail. Are we going to produce a lower high is the key question. And if this breaks down once again, is it, you know, is it going to be enough this time around? Because this has been kind of a conundrum for the market right now. Will it be enough this time around for the XLK to actually start outperforming and break out of its daily balance? Because I, in my estimation, this is kind of what kept us in the balance 
on the Friday session. The fact that the rates were moving higher, tech couldn't really get out of that. It couldn't get out of its own way, to be quite frank with you. Now, something we are monitoring as well is the signal study here that we've put together. If we get through the zero line from negative to positive, in theory, it's been quite correct over the past couple of uh, instances here. As we move from negative to positive, negative to positive, negative to positive, it should signal a downside move coming in the market. Now, this is not something I would bet, you know, every single trade on. I'm just saying as an overall indication for markets, doesn't really look good, the rapid rise in interest rates here into the close of the week. So speaking of interest rates, let's take a look at the tracker tool. So currently expecting about a 78% probability of another 25 basis point rate hike to bring the terminal rate up to 500 to 525 basis points as of the May 3rd meeting. Now, this does strike me as the correct decision considering the employment data that we got two weeks ago. And last week, the CPI numbers came out, right? And they came in at 5%. So although inflation is trending in the right direction, which is down, we're still well above the Fed's mandate of roughly 2% inflation. So another rate hike should be acceptable, so to speak, based on the conditions of the economy right now. But it does bring into question, of course, what does that mean for guidance going forward? Well, good thing we're running right into earnings season, right? So we're going to hold that terminal rate for a couple of meetings here as priced in by the Fed tracker tool and then start some cuts as things potentially start to break as soon as September of this year year. But if we take a look at the earnings calendar, who can we expect to hear from? It's going to be names like Schwab. It's going to be Bank of America, Johnson & Johnson. Goldman will be reporting. Netflix is a big one. I mean, you could take a look through these names uh, individually, but here are just some of the bigger ones that I would certainly be uh, willing to pay attention to, right? They're going to give some guidance as to what they're experiencing from a corporate earnings perspective. If we look at what's unfolded thus far, the scorecard's actually, I think, better than expected, right? And we can see that here. Only 6% of the S&P 500 companies have reported. So I totally understand that it's very, very early in the cycle and the season here, but 90% of that 6% have reported a positive EPS surprise. And that's like, so here's the deal, right? Everybody knew that coming into Q1 earnings, it was going to be brutal, right? There was going to be an expectation that, hey, you're probably not, you know, seeing the type of numbers that we saw prior. That was to be expected. So the fact that we're getting a positive EPS surprise does strike me as a bullish force for our market. Um, the other thing that I would point out is, right, as we're starting to trade, this is the forward 12-month EPS in dark blue here. This is the S&P, obviously, in the light blue. Notice that we were well extended, like, so, you know, a higher... Uh, multiple was being priced into the market as this correction has taken place, where have we found a gravity point right around like what's expected for forward 12 month earnings. It strikes me that like the market has pulled back. It's sort of taken out some of the fluff from the market here. And now we're like waiting to see, okay, when the Fed's done and when cheap money becomes available again, if it becomes available again, like what are the implications for stocks? Are they going to move higher? Well, based on this positive surprise here, so far, I mean, the forecast going out further certainly looks somewhat helpful, right? So here's just another way to visualize that here. Here is the percent surprise based on a five-year normal. So that's the dotted line in here. Notice that we're above or right at, I should say, that surprise benchmark. So, so far, so good. This is going to be helpful in terms of reactions from actual stock prices, not necessarily the fundamental outlook of the company, but the price of the stock itself should respond favorably to this type of information. And then lastly, what is the longer term outlook for earnings here. Let's point out that Q2 is expected to be pretty rough as well with a 4.6% decline in earnings. But then things start to look up as we get towards the end of the year. Look at Q4 of 2023 with analysts projecting about an 8.8% growth, right? So things, you know, they'll have to get bad, but how do those surprises ultimately uh, impact stock prices themselves? And then what's the projection on the aftermath of this quote unquote recession that everybody's been fearing right now? So I think this is going to become the dominating story as we move through earnings season. And I'm kind of excited to keep you posted on the developments here. With that said, let's dive back into the technical charts. So the TLT fading off relative to the S&P is actually a confirmation in my estimation of what we just read through in the earnings summary there. If surprises on the positive side from earnings are being rewarded better in equities, of course, it would make sense that there's more risk taking in the equities market and not so much a classic flight to safety type trade. Now, if earnings start to come out as the bulk of the numbers start coming out uh, rapidly deteriorating, then that's a different story. This could potentially spike higher, but so far it's actually confirming the data that we've got from the mere 
six percent. I get it very early. Six percent of companies who have reported thus far. Let's take a look at something like the HYG, the junk bonds here, quote unquote, smart money. We're still in a negative divergence with equities making a higher high here into the end of week with the HYG just making an equal high. So it's not the worst thing in the world. It would be much worse if this was still in a lower high like this. But so far, just keeping slight tabs on this rally, I think that this more so agrees with the skepticism that we experienced in the market internals. And if we take a look at something like the Bitcoin chart, just to see what's going on with the digital gold, I just want to continue to keep tabs on, yes, risk on from a digital gold perspective, not one to one, but certainly helpful from a risk appetite perspective. Markets still have some pretty bad breath across the board. New highs versus lows sitting right on the zero line, literally at nine as of Friday's close. I will say that intra-week, it was looking a little bit better. So the fact that these higher readings could not hold into the Friday session doesn't really strike me as the most confident inducing move for the upcoming week's worth of trade. If we take a look at something like our SPX A200R, spending more time above the 50% mark, so that's helpful. And then taking a look at something like the SPX A50R, so stocks above the 250 50 SMAs respectively in the S&P, the fact that this is now above the 50% mark, certainly more helpful. And again, this is a daily time frame chart. So into the remainder of the week, the fact that it held here does strike me as a constructive look, although we did see a little bit of wiggle back and forth. The key to watch for in this one specifically, SPX A50R, is if the market does sweep the lows of the daily balance area that we just talked about on the SPY daily chart, where does this go? Does it find a higher low somewhere? I don't know. It could be 0 0.3, 0 0.35, whatever. Or does it actually fall all the way back down into this area here? That will be a huge tell for the market if we do see a deeper pullback in the S&P itself. The next thing that we want to take a look at is going to be the RSP equal weight S&P 500. Notice that we're still very far off of these highs. This does strike me as a cause for concern, a big divergence in breadth for our market. This has to start performing in the upward direction if we're truly going to be below levers of any larger break here in the equities market down below the weighted S&P 500. Another divergence that's playing out is the Dow, right? The Dow divergence. So industrials versus transports. Notice that this made a higher high here in the industrials, and we just have a double top in play on the transports, right? It certainly hasn't broken down underneath the neckline, but it's telling us to be very skeptical of this breakout in industrials, not really confirming the move higher. And of course, ripple that out to the S&P. One more reason to be slightly skeptical of the breakout that we saw from the balance area. You want to play this in the upward direction very, very conservatively, I would say, based on some of these observations. VIX is falling off of a cliff now that all of the economic data is in the rearview mirror. I do think that it has some room to dance around down here, some spikes, whatnot, with the earnings that should be announced this upcoming week. But so far, this would indicate comfort with this as a bottom in the S&P as a local low. Let's take a look at the VIX volatility of volatility stuck sideways in the box, confirming the lower VIX itself. And even if we look at some short dated stuff with our nine versus 30 day VIX here for our short dated options registration, we are in a deeper contango go well underneath the zero line. This perk higher in the 30-day option uh, VIX futures up top has certainly re uh, reversed in the downward direction. Again, we're in a strong contango. Risk is lower in the present day than some unknown point in the future. Money managers like that to allocate capital into the market. I would just say, again, based on all of the divergences that we've seen so far, I would do so cautiously, cautiously. Here's the QQQ weekly time frame chart talking about candle structure and location as we typically do. This is another inside bar on the QQQ weekly. It is a green bodied inside bar, but nonetheless, this will become more meaningful when and if we can break this pivot top and see continuation in the upward direction. If we break underneath the lows, of course, we know that that would represent a balance break on the daily time frame chart. We'll talk about that on the daily in just a moment. We're also spending this consolidation above the prior weekly pivot high, and we've closed yet again above the anchored view app from the all time high week back here, as well as, you know, well significantly off of the VWAP from the October low of the past year's worth of trade. So weekly time frame chart does strike me as being more bullish than bearish. If we take a look at the volume profile, I would continue to point out that if we can get the break of this inside bar set up on the weekly time frame, look left, we've got a low volume void. Again, I'm not calling for in the coming week's worth of trade that we rotate all the way on up to like 365, give or take, but I'm just pointing out there's fairly thin structure from a volume perspective in this general 
general range, which is something to be mindful of. Let's take a look at the daily time frame chart now and see what's going on from this perspective. Let's turn the levels back on and make some assessments about expected moves. So just like in the S&P itself, I would not expect that the market is contained by the expected move this week just because we've been in balance for so long here. There was an attempt to get above balance on the Friday session, but we've closed basically unchanged at 318. Let's keep it very, very simple in the QQQ. If we're above 318, buyers do have an edge here looking for upside over the top. That would be the weekly uh, inside bar breakout level. That's 320.50, looking for the upper edge of expected move here for the higher high at 324.85. And continuation could bring us into 328. If we come back down into range, there's not as clearly a midpoint of this balance range. So it's just all about the bottom at 314. A flush there should easily violate the lower edge of the weekly expected move. A doubling of this range in the downward direction takes us to the top of the gap at 310 and potentially through it to close at 308.20. Again, this balance should lead to some form of excess. I am not convinced that the expected move holds us in the coming week's worth of trade. Let's take a look at the market internal specific to the QQQ. Bear with me as this loads. We'll just point out that the internals were weaker in the QQQ. So could this be a fake break in the upward direction? I would certainly be more skeptical of that in the QQQ and the tech sector specifically. Again, we saw this dynamic in the XLK based on the TNX analysis, right? So the pieces of the puzzle should be coming together here that it's no surprise the QQQ is slightly weaker. Much more negative build in the cumulative tick on the Friday session, some more significant sell side activity. Uh, the net flows for the week were hardly positive, just scratching at positive 21 uh, million, not even 100 million in the positive direction. And the advanced decline are more significant underneath the zero mark here on the Wednesday session. So clear weakness out of the QQQ. Another confirmation of this would be taking a look at the market profile of the NQ, so the NASDAQ futures. This value range from the Thursday session never actually broke the top of the larger balance range, right? If you do something like this, this is the balance range that we're concerned with. Value on Thursday is here. I know it's probably faint on your screen, but trust me, value was inside point of control, firmly inside. Obviously, on the Friday session, it's overlapping inside point of control. It does migrate slightly higher than the Thursday session, but nonetheless, still firmly in the balance area overall. There wasn't too much of a strong desire for new buyers to commit volume up and above the top end of the balance. So very skeptical about the cues right now. It really requires, right, the higher low confirmation that the top of this balance is going to break and provide newfound support if a more significant upside move is going to happen. If it's going to just be a very simple look above and fail, we know that the bottom end of the range should be the target. And on the uh, QQQ, we just pointed that out as 314. And lastly, we've got the IWM weekly time frame chart. What's going on? Candle structure and location certainly strikes me as being more bearish than bullish inside bar on this week's session. Larger upper wick compared to all the other bars we've seen thus far. Closing in the midpoint of this weekly balance. We'll zoom in on that in just a second, but I did want to point out if you bring in the anchored view app from the all time high, we're nowhere near it in the IWM. Obviously, there's some more weakness here out of the small caps, but we're even underneath the anchored view app from the October low. So it doesn't really strike me as all that constructive for an upside move here in the IWM. There's that bear flag we were just referring to, an upper wick rejecting some of the upper portion of this three-week balance that we've been sitting in. Let's take a look at the daily time frame chart. I suppose actually we could go to the volume profile here as well in the IWM. We're sitting on a massive shelf of volume, so I'm not convinced that like larger breaks will become more meaningful. This is a strong area of support, uh, volume-based for the IWM. If there is a rotation in the upward direction, I think that structure is more meaningful as we potentially rotate through this void. This area of sideways consolidation. I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, we covered it as it was taking place, but it just felt like the most boring thing in the world. After a ripping rally, it was the strongest recovery, the first recovery, major recovery from the uh, the good old sickness plunge, if you will. But anyways, enough nostalgia. Let's move on down to a daily time frame chart and see what's more pertinent for the coming week's worth of trade. I mean, this is sort of the flag range. We attempted, like at first we had a level at 176.75. Just want to be very transparent that obviously we've adjusted that to the true top of the breakout range here here, which is now at 179. If we take it out, again, expected move should be completely breached, potentially rotating through the thin structure. I'm not going to call for a move all the way to 186.75, especially given the weakness that we just saw on the weekly time frame chart. We closed week on the uh, Friday session here, of course. So I'm just not really seeing the evidence to support like a huge break underway. I will point out that just like the weekly S&P, there's something to this 
kind of pattern happening here, ascending triangle with continued higher lows being built out. But it really requires that that continues. A line in the sand from that perspective would be 174.50. I also want to put on the anchored view apps from the bottom as like a band cluster. So you can see all this is the October one. We saw that on the weekly time frame chart, but all the other anchored view apps as well. I mean, they're just providing strong, strong resistance up around this area of 180.25. It, again, it just doesn't seem obvious to me that the IWM is completely ready for a break just yet. I think we need to see the performance elsewhere and then maybe this follows. I know it's typically been acting as a leader. So if this does stay underneath 180.25, maybe again, you would just be more cautious about big breaks or continuation in the S&P or QQQ in the upward direction. A line in the sand, as we just pointed out, is right here at 174.50 because it would represent the last opportunity for a higher low. And hopefully now you can see as well, it represents the anchored view app from the first day after the bank plunge back here. So all things considered, IWM clear weakness. If we take a look at the market profile chart of the Russell futures here, what I want to point out is just that point of control has really struggled uh, to meaningfully close. Like here's another one that's weak, right? The only good one was on the Thursday session, but notice that Thursday does not even make a higher high above the Wednesday session. So in this little balance range that we're dealing with on the daily chart, it's not like a ton of new money buyers are willing to commit volume up here at the highs. Nothing on the uh, Friday session, hardly much on the Thursday session. Uh, again, Wednesday's quite weak with the point of control here and here. Just pointing out, again, no surprises that IWM is the weakling of the bunch. So very simply put, wait for the balance to resolve. A continued higher low above 174.50 may be constructive for another attempt at a break here. But until it actually happens, I would dial it back uh, from a risk appetite perspective specific to small caps. If you've made it to this point in the video, I'm sure you're enjoying the analysis. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so you know every single time a new video comes out. And with that, we'll jump right into Apple, leaving it zoomed out so you can see where this prior resistance is coming from at these prior pivot tops, 170.50 and 174.75. I do think that Apple is poised for a continuation type move considering the break out of this balance. Higher low has been produced, nice consolidation bar on the Friday session. A break of the equal highs at 167 should produce that continuation. Again, 170.50 is the first level to contend with where do the bears get happy here? If we zoom in, just remember that it's not technically a double top until it is. So we could back off from here. Higher lows are preserved over 162.25. Bears are happy with lower highs underneath 162.25, looking for the gap to close. And then ultimately the retest once again of 156.50. Next up, we've got Netflix. Very simple very, very simple here. Daily balance range, almost like everything else. Patience until we take out the top, 348.50, or patience until we take out the bottom, 332.50, right? It's been an up, down, up, down type of week. I wouldn't really say that there's any clear edge based on this daily time frame chart. Be mindful of earnings in the coming week's worth of trade. Next up is Tesla. This one does look a little bit uh, opportune for a bear flag breakdown. Again, remember that earnings are this week specific to Tesla. However, we're just continuing to get rejections of the bottom of this overhead supply. We haven't really made a meaningful attempt to get back above 188.50. So the more time we spend underneath, the more meaningful it becomes for the potential flush under 177.65, uh, there we go, into the low here at 168.35. That would, of course, take us for a measured move of that flag. Fantastic. If we get a higher low back above 188.50, we will reconsider longs in the upward direction. Google looking at the cup and handle in the cup and handle, potentially forming another cup and handle. Here was the last one, right? It broke to the upward direction. Is this like a 15 minute cup and handle? Maybe. Let's not get crazy with it though. Over 108.75 sees continuation out of this pattern into 110.75. And after that, a little bit of a stretch. I don't know about this week, but 113.50. Pullbacks, of course, to stay bullish, just want to stay above this breakout point here and the two bar highs at 106.50. Bears are content with the double top on a lower high underneath to test the neckline of the pattern. Things don't really fail until we're underneath 103.75. Next, Next up, we've got Metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's fantasy land? The trade is complete. It took a little while to unfold, uh, but ultimately it did unfold, right? So we got the break, that continuation over to 1650. We talked about it relentlessly in the pre-market lives. We're home. We're at 221. I would expect some cool off, some pause. Notice that we had to rally from deeper in the Thursday range on the Friday session. It wasn't just a clean continuation move. So consolidation pullback, not totally unreasonable. Let's go out to like a two-year chart here and potentially see where that next resistance is coming from. You can see it's the top from the first 
strong attempt on the major gap down from the earnings cycle back here. It feels like eons ago, but nonetheless, that's 234 if there is just a straight up continuation move in the upward direction. Let's take a look at Nivda. Taking a look here, uh, the head and shoulders pattern is all the rave right now, but again, you do not need to be the first one in the door on this particular setup. There's plenty of range to be trading for in the downward direction here. Let's just call it 262 down to 242, 20 points of range. You don't need to be the first short who literally shorts at 262. So wait for the confirmation break of the neckline before attempting to short this topping pattern. It's got to be some sort of move and lower high underneath for the flush. Notice that on the Friday session, we take out the Thursday low. And what do the AI buying maniacs do? They send it right back higher, right? So don't be surprised if this just goes sideways. I think it's poised based on the strength of the previous trend and so many people wanting to short this thing up here at the highs. I think it's actually poised to fake a lot of people out. I think it could sweep the lows, come in here and just go sideways and disappoint longs and shorts alike. So be mindful of that as an outcome in NVIDIA. But nonetheless, patience is the play there if you are trying to be the short. Next up is Softy, stuck in a balance range. Let's keep it simple, over 289.25, under 281.50 and we'll take it from there. Next up, we've got last but not least, the mini beast, Amazon, the laggard of the pack, finally higher low back above this previous structure, which flushed early on in the week here. So liking the constructive look of Friday's low over 101.25, but for breaks like consolidation and then a follow through move looks a lot better. That's over 103.90 tags, the 200 SMA and potentially 108 breakdowns back under 101.25. Got to be a lower high. Actually willing to go with the break of Friday's low, perhaps considering we already have a daily lower high from here to here, and we violated through this support a number of times. So potentially going with breaks of 101.25 for downward continuation. Ideally, this time around, we make it to the bottom of the range here at 96.50. And last reminder, just hit that thumbs up button, subscribe bell button, all that stuff YouTube tells us to tell you about. And let's get into the first trade idea on DIS, good old Walt Disney Company. What's going on here? Certainly a constructive looking bottoming formation with a higher low in place. We're consolidating above the neckline if you want to call that a higher low double bottom, right? Little liquidation break on the Wednesday session back above. Requires a little bit of patience. The break is over 102.50, clearing these moving averages. Look left, thin structure through the breakdown. Target is 107.68, where the breakdown came came from on that red bar up here. Not interested if we can't break that level in the first place. Again, 102.50 on the upside. Next up is PANW, Palo Alto Networks. What's going on over here? Just an ideal, ideal topping sort of pressure cooker top forming at 200, right? Psychological number, perfect touches to this area, right to prior resistance over here. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's almost right to the penny. If we can get the break of 200, look left, thin structure as this breakdown was taking place, all-time highs are basically back on the table at 211. So an 11 point move in the upward direction, just like Nvidia, you don't have to be the first one in the door for this particular setup. If you wanna wait for the confirmation higher low above, something that does this, be my guest. A little bit of confirmation here would not hurt. I do like the bullish engulfer from the Friday session, opening on a severe gap down, rallying to close at the highs, and again, threatening that almighty 200. So that is going to wrap up this week's episode of the Weekly Watchlist. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything new, let me know down below in the comment section or by simply giving the video a thumbs up. I hope to see every single one of you guys live at 8.30 on the channel for our pre-market prep. And with that said, I hope you have a green trading week.